Shocking numbers tonight about cyber theft. 30 million people, almost one in 10 Americans, could be victims of the biggest hack attack yet. This is Special Report. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. The cyber theft of personnel data for federal workers may be much more extensive than even the worst case scenario reports before now. Lawmakers heard mind blowing numbers today as they tried to get to the bottom of what happened to all that information and who took it. Now, confirmation that White House personnel data was taken as well. We have Fox Team coverage tonight. James Rosen is at the White House with how all this affects U.S. relations with China. But we begin with Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge here in the Bureau tonight. Good evening, Catherine. Well, thank you, Brett. A short time ago, the Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson wrapped up his classified briefing of the full Senate. As Fox News has learned, as many as 18 million current, former, and prospective government employees are affected by the breach. And the number could spike as high as 30 million when relatives and references listed on security clearance applications are factored in. Because it's OPM today, it'll be another agency tomorrow. That warning from a senior Senate Democrat, as witnesses testified, involved. the federal government's Human Resources Department, known as OPM, is still assessing the fallout, and it will get much worse than the first breach in April of several million files. We have uh, estimated that to be a, to a little over four million, as I've described. What's the total number of files that potentially could be breached? That's what we're investigating right now, sir. That 4 million figure is misleading because the second OPM breach detected earlier this month included the micro-targeting of security clearance applications known as SF-86. More than 100 pages long, the applications require military and police records, alcohol and drug use, as well as sensitive information about relatives. Even it senior administration staff were notified they may have been affected. I was. Can you give us a sense of how many people in this office were on that same uh, it's a big, it's executive office right now working for the yeah. president? Uh, I, I don't know how many people at the White House were affected. A well-placed intelligence source tells Fox the attack's high level of organization points to a nation state and the likely backing of Chinese military units such as PLA 61398 housed in this nondescript office complex in suburban Shanghai. Fox is told hackers gained access to OPM's database using credentials stolen from a private contractor, Keypoint, that was breached in December. While the uh, adversary leveraged a, a compromised Keypoint user credential uh, to gain access to OPM's network, uh, we don't have any evidence that would suggest that Keypoint as a company was responsible or directly involved. Investigators are considering whether the OPM files will be aggregated with other sensitive records for identity theft, impersonation, blackmail, or further cyber attacks. Health insurance companies, uh, background investigation, contractors, and government entities, so it, it, it would not surprise me to see more. In a surprising exchange, witnesses said traditional safeguards, including encryption, would have made no difference. In this particular case, it would not have prevented it. Well, my question wasn't whether it would have prevented the breach. It was whether it would have prevented the accessibility and use of personally identifying information once the system was breached. Uh, no, it would not have in this case. Well, those affected by the first OPM breach are being offered 18 months of free credit monitoring. It's not clear the same level of basic protection will be extended to the relatives affected. Brett. Well, follow, Captain. Thank you. You're welcome. China's implication in cyber theft complicates what are already delicate relations with the world's most populous country. Chief Washington correspondent James Rosen has that story tonight from the White House. This is not lecturing. Please do not misunderstand me. Vice President Biden kicking off the seventh annual strategic and economic dialogue between the U.S. and China was not the only American eager to be seen not lecturing his Chinese visitors. Secretary of State Thank Kerry devoted at least as much attention to climate change. This topic alone, frankly, validates our dialogue. As to other areas of concern he grouped together. And we look forward to a very frank discussion of cyber security and other ongoing concerns such as internet freedom, human rights, and religious liberty. This year's talks unfold amid reports of Chinese complicity in a hacking of the White House Office of Personnel Management. Did U.S. officials raise that? I can't confirm specifically that uh, uh, the breach uh, at OPM was, was discussed, but I, I would point to what I said yesterday, which that 
cybersecurity issues routinely come up. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew delivered the sternest public rebuke on cyber, softened by bland language about China's interest in upholding the global economic and financial architecture. This includes responsibilities to abide by certain standards of behavior within cyberspace. The Chinese warned their hosts to choose dialogue over confrontation, even when consensus proves elusive. Decision makers of both countries must always remember that confrontation is a negative sum game in which both sides will pay heavy prices and the world will suffer too. Douglas Paul, who served on the National Security Council under Ronald Reagan and the first George Bush, cited President Obama's recent failures to secure trade promotion authority and halt the creation of an Asian infrastructure investment bank as examples of why China might be getting the better of the dialogue. There's a lot of uh, issues of competency on the American side and it's allowing China more running room. Overall, China has gotten stronger during this period and the U.S. ability to pull itself together has been scattershot. Vice President Biden also urged the Chinese not to misunderstand U.S. intentions in the Pacific, reminding his visitors at one point that the United States boasts over 7,600 miles of shoreline along that body of water. Brett. James, we're expecting the White House to announce tomorrow this major revision to its policy on negotiating with terrorist groups holding hostages. What can you tell us about that? Yes, senior officials have confirmed to Fox News that tomorrow we'll see the release of a presidential directive and executive order that will create a hostage recovery fusion cell, a full-time agency embedded inside the FBI with its own director that will coordinate all of the rescue and release efforts for U.S. hostages and also manage communications with their families. These documents will also make clear that the families need not fear federal prosecution if they pursue ransom payments. However, the White House also made clear today there will be no change to the no concessions to terrorist groups policy on the part of the United States, even though the United States abandoned that policy, made an exception for it in the case of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl last year, Brett. Yeah, good point. James Rosen, Live of the North Lawn. James, thank you. Another positive day on Wall Street today. The Dow gained 24. The S&P 500 finished ahead one. The Nasdaq gained six for a new record close. A big boost tonight for the Republican effort to resurrect President Obama's trade agenda after its initial defeat by Democrats. Democrats. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live on Capitol Hill tonight with a story of some very unusual alliances. Good evening, Mike. Well, Brett, good evening. It was definitely close, but in the end, it had just enough support to meet the minimum requirement and pass this procedural test. The vote was 60 to 37. Definitely closer than the last time senators voted on trade promotion authority. The measure would authorize President Obama and the next president Mr. to negotiate Shelby. free trade deals, and then Congress would have months to review it and have an up or down vote. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell called this a huge win. Of all the things that we've been able to work on on a bipartisan basis during the Obama years, uh, this is probably the most significant accomplishment for the country. Two senators who voted yes the last time were no votes today. Republican Ted Cruz from Texas and Democrat Ben Cardin from Maryland, and that meant there was just enough support. Three presidential candidates in the Senate, Cruz, Rand Paul, and Bernie Sanders, voted against it today. Sanders blasted the measure right after the vote. We need a new trade policy in America, a policy that represents working families and not just the big money interests. I strongly disagree with the majority leader who called this a great day for America. It is not a great day. President Obama was embarrassed by his fellow Democrats on the trade issue earlier this month. The president made a face-to-face -face appeal to House Democrats. Then after a walking with the president, Leader Nancy Pelosi said she'd vote against trade, and it failed. Today, White House spokesman Josh Earnest said the work on trade is not done yet. The president also wants to provide vital support like job training and community college education to an estimated 100,000 workers per year. That's why he continues to urge Congress to send trade adjustment assistance to his desk this week so he can sign it and do exactly that. Expect trade promotion to pass the Senate tomorrow. Trade assistance could potentially pass by the end of the week. Brett? We're watching it. Mike Emanuel live on the Hill. Mike, thanks. Up next, what other states displaying potentially offensive symbols are doing in the wake of the South Carolina church shootings? First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 11 in Los Angeles with assault charges against hip-hop music mogul Diddy. Sean Combs, Diddy's real name, is out on bail. 
He allegedly swung a kettlebell during a fight at the UCLA athletic facilities. Combs' son, Justin, plays on the Bruins football team. Fox 25 in Boston with New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady beginning his appeal of a four-game suspension for involvement in the suspected intentional deflation of footballs. You remember that? Deflategate. Brady and union reps are meeting with NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. And we'll take a live look at Eden Prairie, Minnesota from Fox 9 in the Twin Cities. The big story there tonight, Minneapolis-based General Mills announces it is officially dropping artificial colors and flavors from its cereals. It's the first major cereal company to replace those artificial ingredients with fruits, vegetables, and spices. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway. From Special Report, we'll be right back.